ladies and gentlemen, we would like to make a presentation to the owner of the Los Angeles Wolves and the man who has sponsored the Wolverhampton Wolves this year, Mr. Jack Kent Cook. When we decided to start soccer here in America, I was warned constantly that this is a dull game. Isn't it one of the most exciting games you've ever seen in your life? There isn't a writer in Hollywood, there never has been one, who could have written a script for the game tonight. Next year, and the year after, and all the years to come, we're going to be proudly privileged to bring you wonderful fans, Major League Soccer here in Los Angeles, and thank you so much. The idea of professional soccer in the United States, no one had ever really thought about that. Not at that level. You know, the U.S. didn't qualify for World Cup between 1950 and 1990. So soccer was dead, and then the Wolves come along. Park, six foot three, 19 year old, West Bromwich boy. Jerry Taylor, right full back, 20 years, actually 19. Terry Martin, outside right, 25 year old, five feet eight. Terry has been with the Wolves since he was 16. Five feet, ten inches tall, hard tackling player. Terry has earned a reputation as one of the hardest shots in English soccer. Known as Lofty, is his nickname, who is regarded as one of the future great goalies in British soccer. I'd like to meet him right now. <laughs> so the cup goes to Wolverhampton, the personal medal for Bill Slater. Originally, Wolves were a church team, St. Luke's Church. But they became Wolves in 1887, when they were founder members of the Football League. In the 50s, we were big rivals of Manchester United. They were the glamour team. We were the scruffs from the black country. We won the league title three times. First division title, which is the equivalent of today's Premier League. We won the FA Cup twice in 1949 and 1960. The Cup has found a new lair. The Wolves, with skipper Billy Wright clutching the coveted trophy, return in triumph to their hometown. Well played, the boys in black and gold is the cry taken up by the 100,000 crowd as the victory procession moves slowly through the densely packed streets of the Midland City. The 50s into the early 60s it was the golden era, if you like. On match days, the city came alive and you could kind of feel the atmosphere as soon as you stepped onto the railway station. You know, there was a buzz about the place. The smells were different, you know, there was cigarette smoke, obviously some smell of beer. You could drink inside the ground in those days. When there was a crowd in there, I mean, the atmosphere was fantastic. The, the roofs on the stand were like corrugated iron and everything. If it rained, you could hear it bouncing off the roofs like. They were a world-class club at the time, world-famous club. And to be part of that and to walk up and down Waterloo Road and into the state of Molyneux. Doesn't matter whether it was old or not, you smelt that 
adrenaline got into you that's meltless. You were you're in a football club. <laughs> The 1966 World Cup was carried by satellite into the United States, and so a bunch of sportsmen thought, oh, great, next great sport, let's start a league. My name is Kevin Baxter. I'm a sports writer, the primary soccer writer at the Los Angeles Times. Really to understand the Wolves and understand that the, the climate of that time, you have to go back and look at the sporting landscape in, in Southern California then, as opposed to now, because it's so different. Right now, the metropolitan Los Angeles area is probably the most crowded sports landscapes in the world. That's what it's like today. You go back to 1967, totally different. The Dodgers, the, the primary baseball team, had only been here 10 years. The Lakers, who went on to become a dynasty, they had just moved here from Minneapolis. Then the Wolves come along, and they try to find their sort of niche in this landscape, uh, and they offered something unique. And, and that was, I think, what got people's attention. We had baseball, we had football, we had basketball. They offered something unique. Uh, my name is Alan Rothenberg. Uh, I got uh, heavily involved in sports, legal and business activities at a pretty young age. Uh, and in that era, uh, all I knew about as a great sports fan was uh, baseball, football, hockey, and basketball. And I kind of knew that somewhere out there in the world there was something called soccer, but I ended up as a young man working for Jack Kent Cook, who was a sports uh, mogul here in Los Angeles. Uh, and he was one of the founders of professional soccer in the United States uh, in uh, what became the North American Soccer League, although when he started it, it was the United Soccer Association. And I was 28 years old, had never played soccer, never seen a soccer game in my life. Uh, and he basically tapped me to look after this for him. Ronnie Allen, who was manager at the time, called a team meeting and we were in the dressing room and he, and he said, we've been offered this tour to, to Los Angeles like for, for nine weeks, like, and it, who, who wants to go? Well, you, <laughs> yeah, thank you. I mean, I'd never been out of England, I'd even been to Wales. I think the Wolves lads thought they'd won the jackpot by going to Los Angeles. I mean, some other teams, one went to Detroit, somebody else went to Cleveland. I think they were ex extremely pleased that they had done well out of the deal. Well, I didn't know much about it, apart from watching the Cowboy Ninja on television. Well, a lot of the music was now from LA. LA was the in place, wasn't it? John Wayne films and Hollywood is down the road and Santa Monica's down the road and you think, wow. It was a sunshine state, the sun shined every day. And it was a, just a completely different world. You live in a pair of shorts and a t-shirt, you know, a pair of flip-flops, free love, flower power, what, what board do you want? Jack Kent Cook was sort of a, of a guy that wanted to go out and entertain people and take chances. Mr. Jack Kent Cook of the Los Angeles Wolves, basically the owner, he knew this was the beginning of professional soccer football in North America. He was a visionary. When you talk about pioneers in sports, you know, he built the Forum, he owned the Lakers, he brought hockey here. He could create that buzz. It didn't necessarily have to be organic. He could create it. Uh, one of his claims was he said it was a gamble, and I think he saw the Wolves as one of those things to, let's take a shot. Soccer's a growing sport, we'll see if it works. like a 12 hour flight and by the time we got there it was night time but on this coach going to the hotel it was pitch dark you couldn't see nothing and Davey Wagstaff sat next to me he said what are we going to do here for nine weeks I think it's crap I said well you can't see anything it's pitch dark the hotel was great the park across the road that's where we trained every day 
people stopped and watched because they'd never seen it before, had they? Like, soccer wasn't a big game there then, so people stopped and watched. At that time, soccer was primarily an ethnic sport. When you look at the US Open Cup, that was won by teams like the Los Angeles Armenians, the Croatian Soccer Club, Maccabi, was a, uh, a largely Jewish team that played in LA. They were a dominant powerhouse team in the late 60s, early 70s. But we didn't have those huge ethnic populations here at that time. So soccer was sort of not even a secondary sport. It, it wasn't even on a lot of people's radar. Far, far shod. I live in Pacific Palisades in California, retired electrical engineer. When I was much younger back home in Iran, when we would go to movies, they used to have these newsreels. And every once in a while, I would have a little report from typically a big game in England or something like that. And I was always in, oh, how it looked, even though it was black and white, you know, how fantastic the field looked and, you know, thousands of fans and everything, so that image kind of stayed with me. And uh, I had gone with my father to a couple of games, maybe one game. And then we moved to the States uh, in 1965. I, I hadn't really played much soccer. I was just learning the language here. And uh, to this day, I don't know exactly what was the impetus behind going to the uh, LA Wolves games. Classmates in high school may have somehow got word of it, and uh, we decided to go to a couple of games. It should be explained that the United Soccer Association gave North America its first taste of internationally recognized professional soccer in 1967. The league imported 12 complete teams from Europe and South America, one team for each league city. No, and he was a commentator on some of our games, like one of the top commentators in America. He did the basketball and American football. He was a big noise in America. Week one of the United Soccer Association and the Los Angeles Wolves head to the Houston Astrodome in front of 35,000 fans. The first indoor stadium, wasn't it? We'd never seen anything like that before. It was like playing in the future. They had rodeos in uh, American football, and the Wolves and Bangu from Brazil, who we played, was the first professional football match that was played on AstroTurf. That was the start of our tour. A first win followed a week later at the Coliseum, before Wolves headed north to the torrential rain of Cleveland and Toronto. They said they were touring like a rock band, zigzagging across the country. The games and goals came thick and fast, with manager Ronnie Allen even having to come on as a substitute in one game. After two rampant displays, the Wolves were undefeated and top of the table by the halfway point of the championship. But it wasn't all work, work, work for the Wolves. Jack Kinkle invited us all to a garden party at his uh, place in Beverly Hills. His next door neighbour was Jerry Lewis, which was about, his garden was about three miles away down the road line. Lee Marvin came in and sat up the corner somewhere. It was a completely different world to, 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 to what we came from. Here's me, a teenager, being introduced to all these movie stars, singers. It was a dream. Biscuit was an elegant man, uh, a classy guy. He was an Anglophile, and so he wanted to make sure that, that, that you know, they were treated like royalty, because as far as he was concerned, they were. And we're all around the swimming pool. It was a day off, and who comes waltzing into the Sharon Wiltshire Hotel around the swimming pool with Davy Jones of the Monkees, David Wagstaff. It was incredible. David Jones of the Monkeys, we, we went to the, because he went to school with Waggy, 
invited us to the studios to watch him film the monkey show. Took us shopping, which was nice, get some tops. The first time we went to the restaurant to eat, and it's a breakfast, like bacon and egg and everything. She, she said, how do you want your egg? I said, fried. She said, yes, but easy over. I, I, I ain't got a clue what she was talking about. I think we actually had the best location that we could have wished for on that tour. I used to go to the Whiskey A Go Go Club, at the time the most iconic club in the world. People were saying, do you want some weed? Hey man, do you want some weed? And we thought, we're in trouble here. Jimmy Hendrix was there, the four tops, Eric Burton and the animals. But the only problem was we couldn't drink because you had to be 21 to drink. Even Dave Burnside, who was 35 and nearly bald ass, he was over the moon because they asked for his ID. So we flew to bed, it was $42 return, and we stopped at the Thunderbird Hotel, and this fella was having a wee in this palm tree in the middle of the hall, and it was Trini Lopez. Back on the pitch, there was still work to be done. Things started to turn ugly as the pressure turned up on America's first ever pro footballers. Against the whips, Wolves had Dave Burnside sent off. Eight days later, both Ernie Hunt and Derek Dugan were given their marching orders against the Gales, but the Wolves roared on. Clearly it was ultra competitive right to the end, and momentum built, and they wanted to, to keep playing, and they, they would realize that they have a chance of going to the final. Wolves responded to that first defeat with two strong results. We played in Dallas. And it was, it was over 100 degrees. Peter Knowles got sent off. He got slaughtered for playing with 10 men. And we came off after the game and everybody just lay there. It just was unreal. A 2-2 draw secured the Western Division title for the Los Angeles Wolves. After eight weeks of carnage, the final was just around the corner. The Washington Whips, who were represented by Aberdeen and Scotland, emerged as winners in the Eastern Division. The Los Angeles Wolves, who actually were the Wolverhampton Wolves of England, captured the Western Division title. And the Whips and the Wolves met in a championship playoff game at Los Angeles' Memorial Coliseum to climax the United Soccer Association's inaugural season. The Coliseum has always been the place. It's 100 years old, celebrating its 100th birthday this year, 2023. It's held the Olympics. Um, John F. Kennedy accepted the Democratic nomination to be president at the Coliseum. If you're an artist, you want to go play Carnegie Hall, right? Or you want to go play the Hollywood Bowl, maybe. If, if you're going to be a, an athlete in Southern California in virtually any sport, you have to play at the Coliseum. Scotland versus England, you know. Robert Clark, he's six feet tall, young, aggressive, and a tremendous goalkeeper. It must be my mother that wrote this. James Boyce White, full back, born in Colesaith, 29th of September 1944. Stroke was an intelligent fullback who was safe and steady in defence and constructive flair and attack. Turnbull had a psyched up for it. You know, the manager, he had a psyched up. He was like, oh, look at that, Braveheart. You know, come on. <laughs> now, the match they played has been rated by many observers as the greatest soccer game ever seen anywhere. And we're convinced that you will agree with that conclusion after viewing this film. The first half of the match produced plenty of exciting play, but only two goals. The first one came with just two and a half minutes right, gone the game. centering pass taken out of the penalty box. Los Angeles over the head kick by Thompson, headed by Dugan. He was a quality, quality player. Nice save! Well, that's me, I just caught one. That's the difference in the game when you can catch it and bounce it and run with it. We didn't have gloves when I played. Now with it is Wagstaff. Plenty of body contact. Wagstaff's flattened. 
Oh, it was, it was really brutal. We didn't need a ball. We were just getting each other. Pass to Dugan too long. Dugan swung down by number five, McMillan. I've never played in that sort of football before. Wharton after it. He's got it. Down he goes and Harden, look out. Don't lose your temper, Terry. Wharton and number two, White, swinging at each other. Nobody saw him. I got kicked a lot. And I was trying to, uh, and I throw, threw a punch to somebody, and it's not like me, that. Wharton and White are having a, a, a fisty cough down the corner flag. <laughs> I think he must be in our best time. <laughs> I've been just going in a mall. Tattle, get up, as you're getting up, you, you just one of them. And I missed him. It's a good job he hit, didn't hit me because he's bigger than me, he was. Still in possession is Martin Bucken. Bucken out in front. Good position for number six, Peterson. Knocked away by Whitfield, shot by Story Number. That was Jimmy Smith, scored the goal. Wasn't very good defending, but then the back four was all over the place. And 12 minutes after Jimmy Smith scored that goal, he was ejected from the game by referee Dick Ebner for an infraction. And this forced Washington to play a man short for the remainder of the match. That was a big loss to us, because Jimmy was a special player. 18 minutes into the second half, the scoring pace picked up dramatically. Each team scored twice within a span of slightly under four minutes. Here's the start of that incredible spree. Look out here! Look out! They're a point down. Out comes the goalie. He misses it. The hell of a header. It was a great header. It was madness. The, the final itself was crazy. And he just went from one end to the other, scoring goals. I'm sure the Americans loved it because they saw the ball going in the back of the net so often. It was just all new to me. I was just trying to soak in. I couldn't get into details or who's who. I didn't have a program to see names and what have you. So that, that was all just a bit surreal. It was happening in front of me and I got quite boisterous and everything. So I think the, the passion and the emotion of, of the moment was probably more than the actual game itself and who was a good player, who was not. I, I didn't know any better. What we should have done, we should have sat back and countered, but it was, it was, a, it was going at, both teams were going at one another. They, they didn't, you know, they didn't stop. Even though we were a man down, we were, we were flying forward. And I just remember those goals got in everywhere, so. There's the story, three to three. 17,824 here. Well, ladies and gentlemen, if you don't like this soccer game, you will never like soccer. Just forget it. Americans, they're looking at scoring. They love a high-scoring match. Well, it, you know, I don't mean to denigrate the NBA. I mean, I was deeply involved. But unless it's close down to the end, it's not really a tough competition. Uh, I mean, you can go, you can take a break and go, you know, go get a hot dog and a beer, miss two or three minutes, and it's okay. I mean, soccer, as you know, is, is, because it's so low scoring, the intensity is there for 90 minutes. Watch it now. Dugan in close. Around one man. Center. Shot. Rules were so elated that scoring so quick. We managed to hit them in the counter again. Unofficially less than two minutes to play in the game. The Wolves lead it. Nice pass. You couldn't script that game. It, it was it was so entertaining, you know, for the neutral. The, even for us, we enjoyed it. Up to Hunt, crossing for Wharton. His center for Dugan. The Dugan's great. He scores a goal, puts it onto his left foot and beats Tommy McMillan, I think it was at the time, and just threw for the net. He was a handful. Watch the Washington fullback reach up and touch the ball with his hand. That's a violation. Only the goalie can use his hand. Now, because of the infraction, referee Dick Giebner awarded the Wolves a penalty kick. Remember, the Wolves leading 5-4. They can wrap it up with this one. Terry Wharton takes it. Oh, great. what a great save. <laughs> what a great, great play by that kid, Bobby Clark. What a remarkable job of blocking the shot. I don't know. 
I think I changed my mind. I never do. I never changed my mind. I changed my mind on this one. And I shouldn't have done. That's the first penalty kick I've ever seen blocked. You know, if I score that, we win. And we only have 90 minutes game. But I missed it. So it all went to extra time and... Coming up for Washington. This game never seemed to stop. And then he went on and went on, and, and you know, and you're thinking it's, it's never going to end. What an unbelievable finish to the 30 minute overtime period. You just can't pack much more action into the short stretch than those two teams did. Even though most of the fans were rooting for the Wolves, they were ecstatic. This was sports excitement at its best. You better believe it. Now the crowd would have a chance to see sudden death overtime, and in sudden death you play until one team scores, and then the game's over. Said we've got to have a winner. There's got to be a winner. Made a run down the wing. I've got Ali Sheeran scored an own goal. An unbelievable game, ending on an unbelievable note. The final score, not only in overtime, but in overtime plus sudden death overtime, and we were approximately six minutes into the sudden death when the own goal. The foot of Schuen brings victory, the North American Soccer Championship, the United Soccer Association Championship, to Los Angeles' Wolves. You know, you, there was only 17,000 there, but you, when you're listening to it, there's a lot of noise, wasn't there? Thank you, Dick. Um, I think everybody in the stadium has seen uh, one of the most fantastic games of football ever being played. And I think that uh, these fellas are as much responsible as these fellas. So I'd like to ask for three cheers for this lot. Okay. They played hard, they played tough, but by golly, with ten men, they frightened us all to death. On behalf of the Wolves team, I would like to thank the people of Los Angeles for coming along to the Coliseum. I hope that in the, in, in the very near future, Los Angeles will have its own team and Wolves can come and play them, and then you'll be booing us. Thank you very much. I think it was probably the start of the development of soccer in America. They opened the door to football and made it more accessible, global if you like. It was a journey that I was part of, I was monitoring, it was so good. The next sensation like that that I had was when the Galaxy built their stadium. I used to drive down there just about every weekend to see the progress. And when that stadium was finished, I said, no, I'm truly home. I think the players were, were very proud of it, and, and why not? It was a monumental effort. And obviously, they played a part in the legacy was to, to help develop football from there in America. So I'm sure they would see that as, a, as a, a matter of pride as well. We won it, we got our trophies, we went back, had a good party, flew home day after, and uh, all was well with the Wolves. The Los Angeles Wolves was the spark of soccer on the North American continent. This game was televised, getting it into the households that didn't know a great deal about true professional soccer in North America, that this was the beginning. It was the wet cement on which all these other things were built. It was probably one of the best times of my life, to be fair. I think people will look back and say, what was the history of soccer in this country? Uh, and when they do, they have to land in 1967 and say, this is where it all began.